right are we on are we live yes let's make sure that i can be heard uh -huh. okay um let's see if everything is functioning right now Looks like every <sighs> yeah, whatever. Okay. No preamble today. I'm just going to get right to it. We are at chapter 10. He had catched a great cold. Had he had no other clothes to wear than the skin of a bear not yet killed. Okay. Young Ladislaw did not pay that visit to which Mr. Book had invited him. And only six days afterwards, Mr. Casabon mentioned that his young relative had started for the continent, seeming by this cold vagueness to waver in query. Indeed, Will had declined to fix on any more precise destination than the, than the entire area of Europe. Genius, he held, is necessary intolerant of fetters, and on the one hand, it may have had it may have the utmost play for its spontane spontaneity. On the other, it may confidently await those messages from the universe which summon it to its peculiar work, only placing itself in an attitude of receptivity towards all sublime chances. The attitudes of Receptivity are various, and Will had sincerely tried many of them. He was not excessively fond of wine, but he had several times taken too much, simply as an experiment in that form of ecstasy, and he fasted until he was faint, and then supped on lobster. He had made himself ill with doses of opium. Nothing, nothing greatly original had resulted from these measures, and the effects of the opium, opium had convinced him that there was an entire dissimilar, dissimilarity between his constitution and De Quincey's. The superadded circumstance which would involve the genius had not yet come. The universe had not yet beckoned. Even Caesar's fortune at one time was but a grand present presentiment. We know that a masquerade all development is, and what effective shapes may be disguised in helpless embryos. In fact, the world is full of hopeful analogies and handsome dubious eggs called possibilities. Will saw clearly enough the pitiful, the pitiful instances of long incubation producing no chick but for gratitude would have laughed at Casabon, whose plotting application, rows of notebooks, and small tapers of learned theories exploring the tossed ruins of the world seemed to enforce a moral entirely encouraging to Will's generous reliance on the intentions of the universe with regards to himself. He had held that reliance to be a mock of genius, and certainly it is no mark to the contrary, genius consisting neither in self-conceit nor in humility, but in a power to make or do, not anything in general, but something in particular. Let him start for the continent then, without our pronouncing on his future. Among all forms of mistake, prophecy is the most gratuitous. 
But at present, this caution against a too hasty judgment interests me more in relation to Mr. Casabon than to his young cousin. If to Dorothea Mr. Casabon had been a mere occasion which had set alight the fine, inflammable material of her youthful illusions, does it follow that he was fairly representative in the minds of those less impassioned, impassioned personages who have hitherto delivered their judgments concerning him? I protest against any absolute conclusion, any prejudice deprived, derived from Mrs. Cadwallader's contempt for a neighboring clergyman's alleged greatness of soul, or Sir James Chetham's poor opinion of his rival's legs, from Mr. Book's failure to elicit, elicit a companion's ideas, or from Celia's criticisms of a middle-aged scholar's personal appearance, I am not sure that the greatest man of his age if ever that solitary superlative existed, could escape these unfavorable reactions of himself in various small mirrors. And even Milton, looking, up, looking for his portrait upon a spoon, must submit to the f fa facial angle of a bumpkin. Moreover, if Mr. Casbon, speaking for himself, has rather a chilling rhetoric it is not therefore certain that there is no good work or fine feeling in him. Did not an immortal physicist and interpreter of hieroglyphics write detestable verses? Has the theory of the solar system been advanced by graceful manual manners and controversial tact? Suppose we turn from outside estimates of a man to wonder with keener interest what is the report of his own consciousness about his doings or capacity, with what hindrances he is carrying on his daily labors, what fading hopes or what deeper fixity of self-delusion the years are making off with him, within him. And with that spirit he wrestles against the universal pressure which will one day be too heavy for him, and bring his heart to the final pause. Doubtless, his lot is important in his own eyes, and the chief reason that we think he asks too large a place in our consideration must be our want of room for him, since we refer him to the divine regard with our perfect confidence. Nay, it is even held sublime for a neighbor to expect the utmost there however little he may have got from us. Mr. Caspon, too, was the center of his own world. If he was liable to think that others were provincially made for him, and especially to consider them in the light of their fitness to the author of A Key to All Mythologies, this trait is not quite alien to us, and like the other medicant hopes of mortals, claims some of our pity. Certainly this affair of his marriage with Miss Brooke touched him more nearly than it did any one of the persons who have hitherto shown their disapproval of it. In the present stage of things, I feel more tenderly towards his experience of success than towards the disappointment of the ami amiable Mr. Sir James. For in truth, as the day fixed for his marriage came nearer, Mr. Casabon did not find his spirits rising, nor did the contemplation that a matrimonial garden scene, where, as all experience showed, the path was to be broadened with flowers, prove persistently more enchanting to him than the accustomed vaults where he walked taper in hand. He did not confess to himself, still less could, have, could he have breathed to another, his surprise at the that though he had won a lovely and noble-hearted girl, he had not won delight, which he had also regarded as an object to be found by search. It is true that he knew all the classical passages implying the contrary, but knowing classical passages, we find, is a mode of motion, which explains why they leave so little extra force for their personal application. 
Poor Mr. Casbon had imagined that his long, studious bachelorhood had stored up for him a compound interest of enjoyment, and that the large drafts on his affections would not fail to be honored, for we all of us, grave or light, get our thoughts entangled in metaphors and act fatefully on the strength of them. And now he was in danger of being saddened by the very con conviction that his circumstances were unusually happy, and there was nothing external by which he could account for a certain blankness of sensibility which came over him just when his expectant gladness should have been most lively, just when he exchanged that accustomed dull dullness uh, of his Lowick library for his visits to the Grange. Here was a weary experience in which he was as utterly condemned to loneliness as in the despair which sometimes threatens him while toil toiling in the morass of authorship without seeming nearer to the goal. And his was, the, his was that worst loneliness which would shrink from sympathy. He could not but wish that Dorothea should think him not less happy than the world would expect her successful suitor to be. And in relationship to his authorship, he, learnt, he leaned on her young trust and veneration. He liked to draw forth her fresh interest in listening, as a means of encouragement to him. In talking to her, he presented all his performance and intentions with the reflected confidence of the pedagogue and rid himself for the time of that chilling ideal audience which crowded his laborious, uncreative hours with a vaporous pressure of Tartarian shades. For to, for to Dorothea, after that toy box history of the world adapted to young ladies, which had made the chief part of her education, Mr. Casabon's talk about his great book was full of new vistas, and this sense of revelation, and this surprise of a nearer introduction to Stoics and Alexandrians as people whose ideas not totally unlike her own, kept in abeyance for the time her usual eagerness for a binding theory that could bring her own life and doctrine into strict connection with that amazing past, and give the remotest sources of knowledge some bearing on her actions. That more complete teaching would come. Mr. Casamon would tell her all that she was looking forward to higher initiation and ideas, as she was looking forward to marriage, and blending her, blending her dim conceptions of both. It would be a great mistake to suppose that Dorothea would have cared about any share in Mr. Casabon's learning as mere accomplishment, for though opinion in the neighborhood of Freshett and Tipton had pronounced her clever, that epithet would ha not have described her to circles in whose more precise vocabulary cleverness implies mere aptitude for knowing and doing, apart from character. All her ignorance Eagerness for acquirement lay within that full current of sym sympathetic mo motive in which her ideas and impulses were habitually swept along. She did not want to deck herself with knowledge to wear it loose from the nerves and blood that fed her action. And if she had written a book, she must have done it as St. Teresa did, under the command of an authority that constrained her conscience but something she yearned for by which her life might be filled with action at once, rational and ardent, and since the time was gone by for guiding visions and spiritual directors, since prayer heightened yearning but not instruction, what lamp was there but knowledge? Surely learned men kept the only oil, and who more learned than Mr. Casabon? Thus, in these brief weeks, Dorothea's joyous, gra grateful expectation was unbroken, and however her lover might occasionally be conscious of flatness, he could never refer to it in any slacking of her affectionate interest. The season was mild enough to encourage the project of extending the wedding journey as far as Rome, 
and Mr. Casabon was anxious for this because he wished to inspect some manuscripts in the Vatican. I still regret, I still regret that your sister is not to accompany us, he said one morning, some time after it had been ascertained that Celia objected to go and that Dorothea did not wish for her companionship. You will have many lonely hours, Dorothea, for I shall be constrained to make the utmost use of my time during our stay in Rome, and I should feel more at liberty if you had a companion. The words, I should feel more at liberty, grated on Dorothea. For the first time in speaking to Mr. Casabon, for the first time in speaking to Mr. Casabon, she colored from annoyance. You have must, you must have mistaken, misunderstood me very much," she said. "If you think I should not enter into the value of your time, if you think that I should not willingly give up whatever in interfered with your using it to the best of your purpose." If you think that I should not willingly give up whatever interfered with your using it to the best purpose. That is very amiable of you in you, my dear Dorothea, said Mr. Casabon, not in the least noticing that she was hurt. But if you had a lady as your companion, I could both I can put you both under the care of a uh, Cicerone, and we could have thus achieved two purposes in the same space of time. Apparently, a Cicerone is a guide who explains antiquities. I beg you, you will not refer to this again, said Dorothea rather haughtily, but immediately she feared that she was wrong, and turning towards him, she laid her hand on his, adding in a different tone, Pray to not be anxious about me. I shall have so much to think of when I'm alone. And at Tantrip will be significant, and Tantrip will be a sufficient companion just to take care of me. I could not bear to have Celia. She would be miserable. It was time to dress. There was to be a dinner party that day, the last of the parties which were held at the Grange as proper preliminaries to the wedding, and Dorothea was glad of a reason for moving away at once on the sound of the bell, as she needed more than her usual amount of preparation. She was ashamed of being irritated from some cause she could not define even to herself, for she thought she had no intention to be untruthful. Her reply had not touched the real hurt within her. Mr. Casabon's words had been quite reasonable, but they had brought a vague, instantaneous sense of aloofness on his part. Surely I am in a strangely selfish, weak, selfish, weak state of mind she said to herself. How can I have a husband who is so much above me without knowing that he needs me less than I need him? Having convinced herself that Mr. Casabon was altogether right, she recovered her equanimity and was an agreeable image of serene dignity when she came into the drawing room with her silver gray dress. The simple lines of her dark brown hair parted over her brow and coiled massively behind in keeping with the entire absence of her manner and expression of all search after mere effect. I don't get it. Sometimes when Dorothea was in company, there seemed to be as complete an air of repose about her as if she had been a picture of Santa Barbara looking out from her tower into the clear air. But these interval, intervals of quietude made the energy of, her energy of her speech and emotion the more remarkable when some outward appeal had touched her. She was naturally the subject of many observations this evening, for the dinner party was large and rather more miscellaneous as to the male portion than any which had been held at the Grange since Mr. Brooks' nieces had re resided with him, so that the talking was done in duos and trios, more or less 
inharmonious. There was the newly erected mayor of Middlemarch, who happened to be a manufacturer, a manufacturer, the philanthropic banker, his brother-in-law, who predominated so much in the town that some called him a Methodist, others a hypocrite, according to the resources of their vocabulary. And there were various professional men. In fact, Mrs. Cadwallader said that Brooke was beginning to treat the middle marchers and that she preferred the farmers at the tithe dinner who drank her health un un pretentiously and were not ashamed of their grandfather's fortune. For in that part of the country, before reform had done its notable part in developing the political consciousness, there was a clearer distinction of ranks and a dimmer distinction of parties, so that Mr. Brooks' miscellaneous invitations seemed to belong to that of general laxity which came from his inordinate travel and habit of talking too much in the form of ideas. Already as Miss Brooke passed out of the dining room, opportunity was found for some interjectual asides. A fine woman, Miss Brooks, an uncommonly fine woman, by God, said Mr. Standish, the old lawyer who had been so long concerned with the landed gentry that he, become, he became landed himself, and used that oath in the deep-mouthed manner as a sort of armorial bearings, stamping the speech of a man who held a good position. Mr. Bulstrode, the banker, seemed to be addressed, but that gentleman disliked coarseness and profanity and merely bowed. The remark was taken up by Mr. Chinley, a middle-aged bachelor and coursing celebrity who had a complexion something like an Easter egg a few hairs carefully arranged, and a carriage implying the consciousness of a distinguished appearance. Yes, but not my style of woman. I like a woman who lays herself out a little more to please us. There should be a little filigree about a woman, something of a coquette. A man likes a sort of challenge. The more of a dead set she makes at you, the better. There is some truth in that, said Mr. Standish disposed to be genial, and by God it's usually that the way with them. I suppose, I suppose it answers some wise ends. Providence made them so, eh, Bulstrode? I shall be disposed to refer credity to another source, said Mr. Bulstrode. I should rather refer it to the devil. I, to be sure, there should be a little devil in a woman, said Mr. Chinley, whose study of the fair sex seemed to have been detrimental to his theology. And I like them blonde, with a certain gait, and a swan neck. Between ourselves, the mayor's daughter is more, my ta more to my taste than Miss Brooke or Miss Celia, either. If I was a married man, I would choose Miss Vincy before either of them. Well, make up, make up, said Mr. Standi Standish, Jocus, jocosly, jocus, jocosly, jocoses, wait. You see, the middle-aged fellows carry the day. Mister Chinley shook his shook his head, with much meaning. He was not going to incur the certainty of being accepted by the woman he would choose. The Miss Vincy, who had the honor of being Mr. Chinley's idea, was, of course, not present. For Mr. Brooke, always objecting to go too far, would not have chosen that his nieces should meet the daughter of a middle March manufacturer, unless it were on a public occasion. The feminine part of the company included none whom Lady Chetham or Mrs. Cadwallader would object to. For Mrs. Renfew, the, co the colonel's widow, was not only unexceptional in point of reading, but also interesting on the grounds of her complaint, complaint, which puzzled the doctors and seemed clearly a case where, in the fullness of professional knowledge, might need the supplement of crackery. Lady Chentham, who attributed her own remarkable, remarkable health 
to homemade bitters, united with the constant medical attention, attendance, entered with much ex exercise of the imagination into Mrs. Renfrew's account of symptoms, and into the amazing futility in her case of all strengthening medicines. Where can all the strengths of these medicines go, my dear? said the mild but stately dowager, turning to Mrs. Cadwallader reflectively when Mrs. Renfrew's attention was called away. It strengthens the disease, said the rector's wife, much too well born not to be an amateur in, in medicine. Everything depends on the constitution. Some people make fat, some blood, and some bile. That's my view of the matter, and whatever they take is a sort of grist to the mill. Then she ought to take medicines that would reduce, reduce the disease, you know, if you are right, my dear, and I think what you say is reasonable. Certainly it is reasonable. I have two sorts of potatoes, feed on the same soil. One of them grows more and more watery. Ah, like this poor Miss Renfrew, that is what I think. Dropsy! There's no swelling, yet it is inwards. I should say she ought to take drying medicines, shouldn't you? Or a dry hot hair bath. Many things might be tried of a drying nature. Let her try a certain perf person's pamphlets, said Mrs. Cadwallader in an undertone, seeing the gentleman enter. He does not want a drying. Who, my dear, said Lady Chetham, a charming woman, not so quick as to nullify the pleasures of explanation. The bridegroom, Casabon, he has certainly been drying up faster since the engagement. The flame of passion, I suppose. I should think he is far from having a good constitution, said Lady Chetham, with a still deeper undertone. And then his studies, so very dry, as you say. Really, by the side of Sir James, he looks like a death's head skinned over for the occasion. Mark my words, in a year from this time, that girl would hate him. She looks up to him as an oracle now, and by the by, she will be at another extreme. Oh, flightiness! How very shocking! I fear she is headstrong, but tell me, you know all about him. Is there anything very bad? What is the truth? The truth? He is as bad as the wrong physic, nasty to take, and sure to disagree. There could not be anything worse than that, said Lady Chetham, who with so vivid, vivid a conception of the physic that she seemed to have learned something exact about Mr. Casabon's disadvantages. However, James will hear nothing against Miss Brooke. He says she is a mirror of all women still. That is, that is a generous make-believe of his. Depend upon it. He likes the little Celia better, and she appreciates him. I hope you like my little Celia. Certainly, she is fonder of geraniums, and seems more docile, though not so fine a figure. We were all talking of physics. Let me tell you about the new young surgeon, Mr. Lydgate. I am told he is wonderfully clever. He certainly looks it. A fine brow, indeed. He is a gentleman. I heard him talking to Humphrey. He talks well. Yes, Mr. Book said he is one of the Lydgates of Northumberland. Really well connected. One does not expect in a particular... One does not expect in, in a practitioner of that kind. For my own part, I like a medical man more on a footing with the servants. They are often all the cleverer. I assure you I found poor Hicks' judgments unfailing. I never knew him wrong. He was coarse and butcher-like, but he knew my constitution. It was a loss to me his going off so suddenly. Dear me, what an animated conversation Miss Book seems to have, seems to be having with this Mr. Lydgate. She is talking cottages and hospitals with him, said Mrs. Cadwallader, whose ears and power of interpretation were quick. 
I believe he is some sort of philanthropist, so Book is sure to take him up. James, said Lady Chatham, as when his said Lady Chatham when her son came near. Bring Mr. Lidgate and introduce him to me. I want to test him. The affable dowager declared herself delighted with this opportunity of, Mr. Mi of making Mr. Lidgate bleh. The affable dowager declared herself delighted with this opportunity of making Mr. Lidgate Lidgate's acquaintance, having heard of his success in treating fever on a new plan. Mr. Lidgate had the medical accomplishment of looking perfectly grave whatever nonsense was talked to him, and his dark, steady eyes gave him impressive, impressiveness in, gave him impressiveness as a lis listener. He was as little as possible like the lamented Hicks, especially in a certain careless refinement about his toilet and utterance. Yet Lady Chetham gathered much confidence from him. He confirmed her view of her own constitution as being peculiar by admitting that all constitutions might be called peculiar, and he did not deny that hers might be more peculiar than others. He did not approve of a too lowering system, including reckless cupping, nor on the other hand an incessant port wine and bark. He said, I think so, with an air of so much deference accompanying the insight of agreement that she formed the most cordial opinions of his talents. I am quite pleased with your protégé, he said to, she said to Mr. Book before going away. My protégé? Who? Uh, dear me, who is that? said Mr. Book. This young Lidgate, the new doctor. He seems to me to understand his profession, his profession, Admirably. Oh, Lidgate, he is not my protege, you know. Only I knew an uncle of his who sent me a letter about him. However, I think he is likely to be a first to be first rate. Has studied in Paris, New Brussels, Ro Brussels, and has ideas, you know. Wants to ra raise the profession. Lydgate has lots of ideas, quite new, about ventilation and diet, that sort of thing, resumed Mr. Brooks, after he had handed out Lady Chetham and returned to be civil to a group of middle, middle marchers. Hang it, do you think that is quite sound, upsetting the old treatment which has made Englishmen what they are, said Mr. Standish. Medical knowledge is at a low ebb among us, said Mr. Balstrode, who spoke in an subdued tone and had a rather sickly air. I, for my part, hail the advent of Mr. Lidgate. I hope to find a good reason for confiding the new hospital to his management. That is all very fine, replied Mr. Standish, who was not fond, fond of Mr. Balstrode. If you like him to try experiments on your hospital patients and kill a few for charity, I have no objection. But I am not going to hand money out of my purse to have experiments tried on me. I like treatments that have been tested a little. Well, you know, Standish, every dose you take in is a, is a nah. Well, you know, Standish, every dose you take in is an experiment. An experiment, you know, said Mr. Book, nodding towards the lawyer. Oh, if you talk in that sense, said Mr. Standish, with as much disgust as such non-legal quibbling as a man can well betray, betray towards a valuable client. I should be glad of any treatment that would cure me without reducing me to a skeleton like poor Granger, said Mr. Vincey, the mayor, a florid man who could have served for a study of flesh in striking con contrast with the Franciscan tints of Mr. Bolstrode. It is an uncommonly dangerous thing to be left without any padding against the shafts of disease, as somebody said. I think it is a very good expression myself. Mr. Lidlate, Mr. Lidgate, of course, was out of hearing. He had quitted the party early and would have thought it altogether tedious, but for the novelty of certain introductions especially the introduction to Mrs. Book, 
whose youthful bloom with her approaching marriage to that faded scholar and her interest in matters socially useful gave her the piquancy piquancy of an unusual combination. She is a good creature, that fine girl, but a little too honest, he thought. It is troublesome to talk to such women. They are always wanting reasons, yet they are too ignorant to understand the merits of any questions, and usually fall back on their moral sense to settle things after their own taste. Evidently, Miss Brooke was not Mr. Lydgate's style of woman any more than Mr. Chinley's. Considered indeed, in relationship in relation to the latter, whose mind was mature, she was altogether a mistake and calculated to shock his trust in final causes, including the adaptation of fine young woman to purple-faced bachelors. But Lydgate was less ripe and might possibly have experience before him which would modify his opinion as to the most excellent things in women. Miss Brooke, however, was not again seen by either of these gentlemen under her maiden name. Not long after the dinner party, she had become Mrs. Casabon and was on her way to Rome. Okay, and that is the end of chapter 10. Let us see how long 11 is. Nope. Yeah, no, 11 and 12 are going to have to be their own videos. I am not reading any more of that. Well, two more weeks. Two more weeks and I'll be done with book one. And we can move on to something else. Woo! <sighs> well, that's, uh, that's all I'm going to say, I guess. I, I don't really have a lot going on. So, uh, thanks for watching. Bye.